tonight, uh, Professor Richard Pipes. Uh, Professor Pipes has a long list of career accomplishments, uh, so long that if I can't do justice, I couldn't go through it all. Uh, so I'll just uh, say a few highlights of, uh, of Professor Pipes' uh, background. He taught at Harvard University from 1950 until his retirement in 1996, and he is now Baird Professor Emeritus of History at Harvard University. During the 1970s, he was an advisor to Senator Henry Jackson. And in 1976, uh, then CIA Director George H.W. Bush authorized him to head Team B, which was composed of civilian experts uh, to assess Soviet military strategy and ambition. And Team B provided a competitive analysis to what was known as Team A, which was uh, composed solely of CIA uh, intelligence officials. In 1981 and 1982, Professor Pipe served as a member of the National Security Council. He held the post of Director of East European and Soviet Affairs under President Ronald Reagan. Uh, Professor Pipes also is uh, quite well known for his uh, many influential, influential publications on Russian history. These include Russia Under the Old Regime, which was published in 1974. The Russian Revolution, which was published in 1990. Uh, Russia under the Bolshevik regime, which was published in 1994. And in 1999, uh, Professor Pipes published another hugely important work, which was entitled Property and Freedom. In Property and Freedom, he offers a vigorous defense of private property. And ar he argues that uh, private property rights are essential in fostering the political and legal institutions uh, that secure freedom. Uh, so the topic of tonight's discussion is, pro is property and freedom, and so we're very excited to uh, hear this uh, straight from uh, Professor Pipes. So without any further delay, I'll turn the, the floor over to uh, Professor Pipes. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Sauer. I'm delighted to be back here. I taught at this university shortly in 1970s, and every time I come back to Israel, which is every few years, I'm always astonished by the incredible progress this country makes. Um, I go to Russia as well very often, and I don't see any sense of physical progress there. Uh, yes, Moscow, a lot of traffic, a lot of stores, but basically the country seems to be standing still, and this country develops at an incredible rate. I mean, I remember driving my car from Tel Aviv to um, Jerusalem on a winding two-lane road. And I came yesterday from the airport and I drove on a straight superhighway at an incredible 80 miles an hour, which I don't particularly like, but uh, uh, it's, the progress here is astonishing. And I'm glad to have a chance to speak to you. Now, let me explain uh, how I got to this topic. Um, uh, if you look at my bibliography, I've published some 21, 22 books. And uh, with one exception, which is a textbook of Western civilization, they all deal with Russia or the Soviet Union. Um, this property and freedom is the other exception. And why did I do that? The reason is that uh, I, uh, studying Russian history, I was always surprised and puzzled. And why Russia, which is geographically part of Europe, which is racially part of Europe because Russians are Slavs and Slavs are Europeans, speak a Slavic European language, who profess a European religion, because Christianity, of course, is European, why they never developed democratic institutions, civil liberties, a rule of law, any of these institutions which we associate with Western civilization. And I wrote a book called uh, Russian of the Old Regime, which in some respects is perhaps my most important book, in which I outline the fact that the Russians lack the institution of private property. Now, uh, private property was important in one respect, with respect to land. Russia was, until the late 19th century, predominantly an agricultural country. 80% of Russia's population uh, at the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century was occupied in agriculture. Uh, so when we talk about property, we talk about landed property because there was very little international trade 
uh, there was very little trade altogether. Most of the trade was local, local markets, and uh, virtually no industry, and what such industry as there was, was usually run by foreigners. Um, this is, seems to me to be a critical factor in the evolution of Russia and other non-European countries. Generally, uh, historians of the West pay very little attention to the institution of property. I'd like to quote to you a passage from the English historian Marcus Cunliffe, in which he says the following. If you look for the word property in the index of books dealing with the evolution of American attitudes, but this applies also to European attitudes, you will tend to find nothing there. Run your eyes down the list. Progress, and I'm talking about the index now. Progress, prohibition, then a gap where you might expect to see property. The series passes straight on to say prostitution. And in fact, it is a fact that uh, in the histories of Western civilization, history of the United States, property doesn't figure at all, even though it's absolutely central to the evolution of Europe and the evolution of America. In recent years, uh, there's been a great awareness of the role which private property plays in economic progress, in the evolution of the economies. You have books by authors such as Douglas North, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, David Landis, my colleague at Harvard, Tom Bethel. But you will find virtually no literature devoted to the role of property in the evolution of freedom. But the plain fact is that uh, guarantees of property place natural limits to the power of the state for a very simple reason. Where well, if we take an extreme case, such as uh, communist Russia, communist Soviet Union, the state owned all productive wealth. Therefore, every citizen, for all practical purposes, was an employee of the state. He could not challenge the state. He depended entirely on the state. Then you get the extreme or opposite, say the United States, where the government is dependent on, this, on, the, on the public, on the citizens, because it, it has no money of its own, basically, or it has some money, but not sufficient to run the army and the navy and the air force, the uh, judicial system, the transportation system, and so on. So where you have no property, such as you didn't have, no private property, such as was the case in, in communist country, uh, Soviet Union most notably, that the population is entirely dependent on, this, on the state. You cannot object to the, what the state does because you can promptly lose your, 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 your position and end up in the gulag, where conversely, the uh, state is dependent on the population. There, you have freedom. And I'll explain this in, a little bit later in, in the example of, uh, uh, of England. Um, in fact, the very word freedom is unknown in many countries, in many civilizations, because they had no private property. Uh, Moses Finley, the historian of classical antiquity, says, and I quote, it is impossible to translate the word freedom, eleutheria, in Greek, libertas in Latin, or free man, into any ancient Near Eastern language, including Hebrew or into any Far Eastern language either, for that matter. I'm told, I don't speak Hebrew, I'm told that there is something resembling freedom in Hebrew, and, uh, but I, I understand also there is no noun which says freedom. There's something, there's, there's something about freedom in the language, but no noun called freedom. But you may correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But if you look at other uh, so-called third world languages, sorry? And that's her root, yes. yes. But this is not freedom. Chopesh is also freedom. It's what? Chopesh. Yes. And the Chopesh is an act because it's Chopesh, Chopshi, Chopshi, Yud, Chopshi. All right. And I take it back because I say I'm a major at Hebrew. Now, the Japanese, when they were first exposed to Western influences in the 19th century, had great difficulty translating freedom into their language. They finally settled on Jiyu, which means licentiousness, not freedom. The same holds true of in China and Korea. Now, licentiousness is, of course, not freedom. It's, it's doing what you want to do without regard to the rights of others, without regard to law or anything else. Uh, in Russian, the word is volya. 
for this. Um, Muslim writers face a similar difficulty. And I'm quoting Bernard Lewis, who I'm probably familiar to you, the great historian of the Middle East. This is what Bernard Lewis writes. The first examples in Islamic lands of the use of the term freedom in a clearly defined political sense came from the Ottoman Empire in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and are patently due to European influence. Early references to freedom in the works of Muslim authorship are hostile because they equate freedom with libertinism, licentiousness, and anarchy. Now, the idea of property is essentially a Western idea. And there have been discussions of this idea since very ancient times, certainly since Greek times. And there are people who are for property and there are people who are against property. And I would like to outline very briefly the arguments used by each side. There is a political argument for and against, there is a moral argument for and against, there is an economic argument for and against, and a psychological one. The political argument in favor of property holds, and I subscribe to it, that unless property is distributed in a very uh, unfair manner, it promotes stability and constrains the power of government. Against property, it is argued that the inequality which necessarily accompanies property generates social unrest. That's essentially the Marxist argument. From the moral point of view, it is said by its defenders that property is legitimate because everyone is entitled to the fruits of his, his or her labor, to which the critics of property respond that many owners exert no effort to acquire property because they get it through inheritance and through other means, which is not uh, the result of their own uh, work. The economic argument for property holds that it is the most efficient means of producing wealth. The books I just mentioned uh, make this argument. Whereas the opponents argue that economic activity driven by the pursuit of private gain leads to wasteful competition. The psychological defense of property maintains that ownership enhances a person's sense of identity and self-esteem. Others argue that it corrupts a personality by infecting it with greed. So they have these four different uh, lines of argument about for and against property going back to ancient times. And it, it, almost all arguments for and against property repeat the same arguments over and over in maybe different language. Because uh, property has existed in the West from the earliest times, uh, there is an idea, which goes back to Greek times, that there once was a golden age in the West when uh, there was no property and everything was held in common. Uh, the golden age was uh, expressed by the Greek poet Hesiod and also by Plato and was adopted later on by Marx. Um, uh, and, and it's very interesting that in countries where property does not exist or is very e poorly developed, you don't have this notion of the golden age. Or if you have the idea of something like the golden age, it's, a, it's an age when animals were not uh, uh, attacking human beings. There are, I've read a couple of such examples in Egyptian and other literatures where they say, yes, there was once an age where we were not attacked by lions or by snakes, but not when there was no division of, of mine and thine. 